Thank you, Lynn, and good morning, Bioneers. Woo! Uh, I, I'm Pam, and I always forget to say that. I always stand up and nobody knows who the heck I am. I'm Pam. I'm also with Eco Justice Collaborative and uh, one of the uh, organizers for this year's Bioneers event. And what I would like to do is take a few minutes to introduce to you our first keynote speaker, David Orr, uh, who, as many of you know, is Professor David Orr, Chair of the Environmental Studies Program at Oberlin College. And I think, and I think you'll agree, that having David here with us today to kick off the weekend's activities is going to help us anchor our thinking, uh, help guide our conversations together as we enter three days of discernment, discussion, and envisioning the possible, trying to figure out together what we can do together to heal, to restore and this planet and live more fully and also more lightly on this place we call home. Professor Orr, as you may know, is probably pretty well known, I think you'd agree, for his pioneering work uh, on environmental literacy in higher education and his more recent work in ecological design, including the Oberlin Project. You all know that, right? If you don't, I think you're going to hear something about that today. I'm not sure how much you're here today, so let me just pique your interest and say that this is a joint effort between the city of Oberlin, Oberlin College, and private and institutional partners that was birthed to improve the resilience, prosperity, and sustainability of the community. It's pretty awesome. That's a, it's a partnership I know I want to learn about uh, a whole lot more. And I've also learned that David has a long list of awards, uh, including a Bioneers Award in 2002. Uh, he's an author, an editor, serves on all kinds of boards. He lectures, he's advisor, all kinds of hosts and organizations and agencies and so much more. And I would probably spend all my time with you this morning and not let him get to speak if I told you about all his awards. So please do look at his biography that's posted on our website. They're all important, but what I wanted to do was take a look at who this person was. I've just met him this morning for the first time. I wanted to know a little bit more about the man behind all the work and the success I've been reading about. So I asked myself, what were the foundational experiences that capitulated this extraordinary person into a lifetime career and a journey that includes whole systems thinking and designs that work with natural systems and people rather than against. And I learned that David, just like I'll bet many of us here today, developed a love of nature. Y'all have a love of nature? Yeah, I think you do probably. <laughs> uh, but he developed, he developed that while doing what many of us did, playing in the woods, hiking along the streams and the rivers, watching, meditating, listening, experiencing, touching, using all five senses to experience nature in her glory, whether it was bugs or animals or trees or rocks or plants or water or seasons and landscapes. And his playground just happened to be uh, the Allegheny Mountains of, of Pennsylvania. And I think that when I read about him a little bit, I, I think I came a uh, upon a quote that said, that David said, most of us do what we do as environmentalists and profess what we do as professors because of an early, deep, and vivid resonance between the natural world and ourselves. That is so by an ears. I, I think that, that's a hallmark of why I'm a part of this movement. And he puts his connectedness at the hub of his philosophy. From what I've read, his vocation, which happens to be our collective responsibility in relationship to the earth we've inherited and the earth we will bequeath to the future generations, has an ancestry that runs deep as any bloodline. And in closing, I just want to say, speaking of bloodlines, did you know that our guest comes from a long line of preachers? I found it really interesting to learn that your paternal grandfather, David, gave the christening prayer for uh, Rachel Carson, author of Silent Springs' uh, seminal book. Um, well, she, she, he gave the, the prayer for it. Rachel Carson, not the book, uh, <laughs> that exposed the impact of pesticides on our world. And David's a preacher, too, and I know that because when I started to get to know him, I looked up on YouTube and found a video of you standing in a church talking about how we needed to keep coal in the ground, and I went, you, this is, this is a person I want to get to know. 
Now we have another few preachers with us this weekend, and some may even be here in the audience this morning. But we're going to take the next hour to hear what this preacher has to teach us and tell us this preacher whose love of the natural world keeps him working night and day. And he will help us learn what he sees uh, about resilience in what he calls a black swan world. So with that, please do extend a warm welcome to David Orr. You know, I've spent my whole life trying to live down a preacher background. <laughs> Pam just blew my cover. Uh, uh, you can make a lot out of your ancestry, and I have. Uh, uh, my granddad did give the christening prayer, Rachel Carson's baptism, and uh, uh, I sometimes claim, in a, in a fit of grandiosity, that he also helped her later write Silent Spring. Uh, of course, he was long dead by then, but anyway. Uh, it's really nice to be here. It's nice to be here in Chicago. Pam, thanks for the, the introduction. Um, uh, Chicago has a very special place uh, in the, both for me and for uh, this larger movement, of which we're all a part. Uh, it's been a leader in Green City uh, development. Uh, a former student of mine, Sadio Johnston, spent a few years here as uh, the sustainability coordinator for Mayor Daly. Uh, and Doug was far here. Doug, where are you sitting? Uh, Doug Farr has been a leader in rethinking the design of cities for a long time. Peter Nicholson over here, an OB alum, uh, involved in lots of things. We're trying to get him back to Oberlin to help us work through a leadership academy. Uh, so he's been part of that effort. Uh, but Henry Henderson and uh, SCB Architects, I, mean, I find my, my interactions on professional uh, and personal level here are, are very uh, very deep and very consistent and very inspiring to see what happens here in a large city. Um, the uh, remarks I, I want to make, and I want to start with a, uh, a word about Bioneers. The, uh, I'm on the board of Bioneers, and Kenny Osbell and Nina Simons have been uh, longtime friends. And what Bioneers represents, what you all are part of here in the satellite uh, in Chicago, is a, a global salon. Uh, it's not a university. Uh, it is kind of quasi-official, but it, it is a global salon in uh, all kinds of ways. Are you hearing me okay in the back? You know, I forgot to turn. Is that better? Or am I live out of that one? I, I'm good now. So you didn't hear anything at the start. So I need to repeat everything at the start. For those of you that didn't hear it, it was really profound stuff. And, and it's, it's lost forever. Uh, what I want to say about Bioneers, I'm on the Bioneers board, and Bioneers has been uh, a global salon of ideas. If you go to the, uh, the San Francisco and Marin County meetings, uh, for three days it's a celebration of all kind of wild and crazy people doing all kind of wild and crazy things. But it's, it's talk and it's action. It's combined. And so you're likely to find uh, people planting trees in L.A. and people working with... Uh, uh, indigenous communities in Africa and uh, South Asia, and you, you find all kinds of things, but it's people not content to sit and talk. But it is a salon. Some of the best ideas of the past uh, uh, hundred years, or maybe in, in all of human history, have come through the pioneers, but it's about connections. Uh, it's about how do we come together uh, across species lines, across race and ethnic lines, and across time, and see ourselves as part of this large human enterprise. That's pioneers. And uh, I'm proud to be part of the effort and very proud to be here. Let me, uh, let's get down to work here. Uh, you see the screen. I can't see the screen. The screen's live here. Uh, the Sim Taleb is a uh, 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 Lebanese risk analyst, financial risk analyst. And he wrote a little book uh, a few years back called Black Swan. And it's not the movie. Uh, it's about risks. And the point of the book is that all swans are white till one's black. And you don't really know when one's going to be black. So we're in a world now where there's a lot of unpredictability. And the kind of black swan events, and you remember your, uh, your statistics, you all remember, my students call it statistics, but it's statistics. Uh, and you remember the, the Gaussian curve, uh, bell-shaped curve, and out there is, uh, well, to you over here, it's this, this tail. So it's called a long tail by some people, or a fat tail, or whatever. But the point is that most of our attention has been on the big stuff in that curve. It, it's the things that are highly probable and highly visible. 
what Taleb writes about is that, that where the curve tapers down, it goes out here where we don't really know what the risks are. doesn't mean they're small. Just we don't know what they are. They may be small. They may be huge. But that's what occupies him. And the, the black swan world is a world in which we can't predict the birth of a black swan. All swans are white till one's black. And the black swan is unpredictable. And in the case of the world financial situation or ecology and so forth, this is a tightly wound world. We're together cheek and jowl, and uh, cause and effect are very tightly intertwined. So you can have a guy with too much money on margin over in Singapore. He can crash a several hundred-year-old bank in London, uh, as you recall happened with Barron's Bank. And it, it's a world where uh, some bad planning, uh, a Richter 9 event, uh, probably political corruption and so forth conspired to give us Fukushima. And the uh, ripple effects of Fukushima are now being felt on the uh, U.S. West Coast, where radioactivity, I'm told, uh, this past week is now detectable from Fukushima. Uh, small world, black swan world. Unpredictable, but predictable in its unpredictability. So uh, that's the world that uh, Taleb writes about. And at the end of the, now this is from the, the paperback uh, edition. At the end of the, the, uh, the paperback edition, uh, he summarizes the, the kind of the upshot of uh, his argument. And the point is that nature uh, likes things that are redundant. You look at the way nature organizes things. You have two kidneys and you have two lungs and so forth. A lot of redundancy is built into successful organisms. But uh, doesn't like things that are necessarily too big. Nature would never make Walmart. It would never make uh, a General Motors, putting too many eggs in one basket. And nature doesn't like things that are terribly uh, connected without fire breaks. And so the, upside, the, uh, the upshot for Taleb at the end of the, this is in the, uh, the final part of the, uh, the second edition of the book, that to build a society, as he calls it, robust to error. And begin to think about that. That's the overall design principle. How do we design a world robust to error? And uh, one with, uh, in this case, with firewalls. And I sometimes ask my students to, uh, to think about how systems actually work. Uh, we spend about $30,000 per second every day of the year on something called security. And that does not include $54 billion apparently we spend on surveillance. Uh, by the way, how many FBI agents are here? <laughs> well, we have one hand goes up in the back here. And those of you in the CIA, let me see your hands. Uh, one up here and the, uh, the NSA, that, that's every, all the rest of you. Uh, so we spend $54 billion on, secure, on, on surveillance, another $1 trillion per year on either war fighting or something we call defense. Now, if I was to say to you as a buying ears group, look, I'll give you a third of that amount of money if you'll make us secure, <laughs> how would you do it? Well, you'd start with some justice issues rooted here in, in this uh, university. You'd start with some fairness. You'd start with women's rights. You'd start with all kinds of things that provide real security. That's security, capital S, not small s. And the last thing you'd do would be buy tanks, bombs, planes, and so forth, and drones, and all that. Uh, that's a way to keep it insecure. So you notice the way we designed that system is a perfect, I mean, that, that is the, uh, the perpetual motion machine. We create weapons. And then we deploy weapons. That makes people mad. Then we get what the CIA used to call blowback. And, ah, we're insecure. Then we create more weapons. Do you get the point? Yeah. This can go on forever. So how do we design a world uh, robust to error and robust to malice and robust to acts of God? That, that's the point. That is nothing in our cultural DNA, or very little, I think, in our cultural DNA. You have to go back in time. You have to find good examples, uh, a lot of which are drawn from nature. Uh, Janine Benyus, who's uh, been a binary speaker for many years. Janine Benyus worked in biomimicry. Doug Farr's work in, in urban design. You begin to look at urban patterns and natural systems and what are the commonalities and how do we learn from that kind of system over here to this kind of system. So how do we design a world robust to error? Now, I'm going to get into philosophy just a minute. Uh, can you all see that? That was supposed to elicit laughter from you, but... <laughs> I guess, uh, let's take a coffee break. Let's get you some more caffeine. Uh, you, you know, if you, uh, th this is a paradigm change moment for that horse rider. Uh, if you're optimistic, uh, you don't know enough. If you're pessimistic, that's a sin. You don't want to go there. And so the sweet spot for this guy and for you and me is, uh, is hope. 
But I define hope as a verb with sleeves rolled up. Now, there are variations of hope. I think they're just kind of like a narcotic. Uh, this is a sober hope. This is a hope that is uh, a tincture of a uh, tragic sense of life. This is a, a sense of hope in which we, uh, we do what we do because it's the right thing to do. You can't predict that we're going to win. If you're optimistic, you know you're going to win or you think you're going to win. You're, you're a Boston Red Sox fan or whatever. I'm a Cleveland Indians fan. And as a Cleveland Indians fan, we know about the tragic sense of life. I mean, that's just... Uh, but if, if you're in despair, you don't want to go there. Hope is at that, that sweet spot. So the human condition, things are tough. Now, this was a committee that Time magazine said was sent to save the world. <laughs> they did a hell of a job. Uh, that's Alan Greenspan right in the front with that uh, kind of smirky smile. He is a fan of uh, Ayn Rand. It was a friend of Ayn Rand's. Uh, so was Paul Ryan. Uh, and we, we got trouble. Because now we pointed this slide to simply say in that, that world robust to error, we have to think through how we calibrate the way we earn our keep with the way the world works as a physical system. That world has no way. There's no place to, to dump anything. Uh, if you follow the, the news about the Pacific gyre, there's a gyre or just a big revolving ocean current in the mid-Pacific that is estimated to be roughly the size of the, uh, this is the next slide here, the, say, the, state, the state of Texas or up to the size of the lower 48 states. It extends maybe 100 feet into the water column, maybe 1,000 feet into the water column. No one knows. It's all of our ingenious stuff. It's gone down rivers or been tossed overboard from ocean liners or just washed out to sea, but now it covers uh, an area perhaps uh, half to the, the full size of the lower 48 states. It's our junk and it's our debris. And so now we have to think through all of the things that caused us to do that. That was no accident. That's no anomaly. That gyre and climate change and all those things, those are built into a set of assumptions about the human role in the natural world that now have to be rethought uh, deeply rethought and changed dramatically. That's the Bioneer's mission. Uh, the slide on the screen, <laughs> I just put this in here because I thought it kind of summarized our approach to uh, these things. Uh, this was a uh, uh, license plate on a car that hit a pickup truck uh, that my brother and I were in. And uh, I got out, I was taking slides just for insurance purposes and so forth, and then later I happened to notice her license plate, and I thought, well, that summarizes a whole lot of things. <laughs> Uh, that gets the point. Um, and then uh, there is this little fact. Uh, Gary Larson, where are you when we needed you? Uh, things are coming at us faster than we can reckon with. Uh, in 1965, the first warning to a U.S. president about climate change was given to Lyndon Johnson. That was 1965. We still do not have a de jure climate policy. We have a de facto policy. It's still more or less kind of pedal to the metal. But we don't have a de jure policy. Uh, years back, I worked uh, on Jimmy Carter's transition team. And we, uh, a number of us, including Amory Lovins, gave uh, uh, President-elect Carter a paper uh, on energy policy. That paper still reads well. That was 1976. And to our shame as a nation, that paper, which called for energy efficiency first and did mention climate change, uh, has gone by the, gone by the boards. Uh, we still have not acted on this. And the, the arguments for inaction are threadbare and completely bankrupt. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the fifth IPCC report, which uh, all of you saw uh, come out about a month ago, uh, indicates rather clearly that we are, with 95% certainty, we are the culprits. It's our emission of heat-trapping gases. It's what comes out of our smokestacks and tailpipes. It's us. And now the change is coming much faster than we have expected. And there are two facts that we have to understand and have to be built into the public dialogue about this. One is, the uh, if you look at the superstorm Sandy or the high winds that hit here last night, to the extent you can say that that was caused by climate change or heat-trapping gases, it was what we did 30 years ago. It has nothing to do with 402 parts per million. It has nothing to do with that. This is a, a system with a long lag, and that lag is about 20 or 30 years. Now, this makes it hard for our politics because we respond to the immediate kind of crisis of the day. We don't look much down the road. But that 30-year lag, the oceans are the big thermal anchor. And as the oceans warm and as they acidify, that thermal lag will drop from 30 years to 20 years. You with me? So there is a long lag here. And then once having changed atmospheric chemistry, uh, Paul Crutzen, the, uh, the Dutch climate scientist, coined the phrase the Anthropocene. 
It's just a fancy way of saying we've come out of one geologic era, the Holocene, roughly a 10,000-year, rather calm interlude in which we became everything that we became. That was our highs, our lows, our history, our poetry, our art, our culture, our music. Uh, that was human history. That's the era in which we became what we are now. So Crutzen and other people say that we're now in the Anthropocene. Where we're the driver in this. So having come into the Anthropocene, we're now doing things that cast a long shadow. This is that black swan world. And black swan events are unpredictable, but in uh, Taleb's world, they're also long lives. Their effects ripple globally, and they last a long time. And so in this Anthropocene world, we've changed uh, atmospheric chemistry. And so a world of 400 parts per million, soon to be 410, 420, 450, will not likely stop this before we hit 500 or more. Some people like Joe Rahm say we'll be lucky to stop it at 1,000 parts per million. We are where humans have never been before. And this lasts a long time. The carbon I burned to get here last night on an airplane and then I'll burn tonight to go to Providence, Rhode Island, that carbon lingers in the atmosphere for a long time, hundreds to thousands of years. And so when we think of this as solvable, it isn't solvable in the way we typically as Americans think about solving problems. This is a long lived issue. And if people say, well, that's so depressing, hey, look, just get over it. Face the reality. If people are depressed by depressing things, I find that encouraging. If they're not depressed by depressing things, I find that depressing. So uh, we got a lot of work to do. Time's not our friend. We have to begin to, we, we've been late to get to this, and we have to understand that we've waited too late. Now, for reference point, I don't mean to belabor this, but for reference point, it's said by climate scientists that uh, we have maybe a 50% chance, now it's less, to avoid a 2 degree centigrade, not Fahrenheit, 2 degree centigrade warming. But that used to be, uh, when we, uh, several of us got together and worked on a, a climate action plan for President Obama back in 2008 and again in 2012, and uh, we were told by John Holdren that a two degree centigrade warming was a point of no return. And when I asked John in, in the hallway after the meeting out here at Wingspread, I said, John, what happens over after two degrees, do you think? And he and Rosina Bierbaum both didn't want to answer the question. And so uh, they both got very emotional about this. Now, think about this. We need a reference point to understand risk. This is just way too big. So a 50% chance of avoiding catastrophe, okay, at a planetary scale. Now, you and I wouldn't, unless you're suicidal, you would not get into a car with a one chance in two of a fatal accident. But we now live on a planet where we're being told scientifically that that's about the odds we face. You follow what I'm saying? We spent in the Cold War years, which I lived through all of that, we spent trillions. If we had if, uh, you know, evidence in parts per billion that the Russians were going to do something, we would spend trillions to stop it. Go figure. But if the risk is merely the planet, and for all time, our political system just grinds to a stop and doesn't do anything. You with me? So we've got to work fast. We, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so now I want to talk about miracles. What is the miracle? And you know, one of the problems in Western civilizations, we think of a miracle as being a new device, some kind of technological gadget that generates energy at no cost, uh, does something, but it's always some kind of technical uh, gym crack. Do you follow what I'm saying? So in political campaigns, you have uh, politicians talking about how to increase energy supply. It's going to be nuclear war. Or, no, no, not nuclear war. Well, that'll do it. It'll be nuclear power. It'll be some solar thing, and something goes like this, or it's going to be fusion, or it's going to be something, some gadget. But never on this side where you say, wait, how much do we really have to have? Do we need casinos lit up all day long? Do we need shopping malls lit up at 4 o'clock in the morning? Can we begin to use energy efficiency, what we already know how to do, and a bit of sufficient thinking. What do we really need energy for? And pull that down over here. You follow what I'm saying? This dialogue needs two halves of the dialogue. So miracles, what, what are they? Uh, this is where I live. And I want to talk about this. And let me say just a word about the origins of this. Uh, living in London in 2008, and I wrote a little book called Down to the Wire, Confronting Climate Collapse. And that was a 35,000 feet. That, that was my view of what it means for us to live in this particular era as we go from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. I've got four uh, grandchildren, and uh, I worry about them and the world that we're leaving behind. So that was my uh, book. It's Oxford University Press. It's just uh, down to the wire. It's uh, basically a, a meditation on what it means for us to live in this era and what do we have to do. 
And then about the same time, a bunch of us got together with uh, some foundation money and put together a climate action plan for the next U.S. president, be it Democrat or Republican. And we interviewed everybody that ran for office that year, except for Fred Thompson from Tennessee, who didn't believe climate change is an issue, didn't want to talk to us. So we didn't talk to him. Uh, and the argument behind that paper that eventually was about yay thick that went to uh, uh, President Obama and went to the other uh, people that run for office, including Hillary Clinton, was that time's not our friend. Uh, we have to move on this with a sense of wartime urgency. And that it wasn't climate change. It was not just another issue on a long list of issues. It's the linchpin that holds all of those issues together. It is the uh, leverage point. You want to change the world for the better, that's how you do it. You start bringing down energy consumption and eventually carbon emissions and so forth. And there are lots and lots of ways to do that. We're not without ideas there. And so uh, we all know we still don't have uh, an official energy policy or climate policy. So the question for me was, as with many of you, is where is the leverage for me? And I live in a little town, uh, dead center Rust Belt, a uh, town of about 10,000. This is kind of what we look like. We were founded by a bunch of do-gooders back in 1832. And they, they moved into the town eight miles north of us and found back in the frontier days, it was too rough a town. The guys there drank a lot and they ran them out. And so they moved south of Illyria and came down to Oberlin, which is a swamp, and it really is a swamp. Uh, basements around the city reflect that. Uh, started a little college. It was the first college to accept African Americans and, uh, and women in the 1830s and graduate them. And that's been part of our heritage ever since. And one of the issues for us uh, as a college with that heritage has been, can we take the commitment to human dignity and justice and fairness and access and now relay that to or relate that to planetary issues? Because if we lose the planet, all these other issues are irrelevant. So whatever our causes are, as is said, there are lost causes unless we have a planet on which to put them. You follow me? So we're a little town. We, we uh, a quaint little town. Looks pretty good if you drive through. It looks like it's very prosperous. Twenty-eight percent of our people are at or below poverty. Fifty-two percent of the kids in the public schools are on free and reduced lunch costs. Um, I said at a Bioneers gathering four years ago that this particular picture was taken by a first-year student that we strapped to a helium-filled balloon. And uh, I said Bob was such a nice kid. We gave him a, a camera with an electronic download, and he was a first-year student, and he, he was so eager to help. And so we said, get in this balloon, and he went up and took this picture. I said he didn't transfer from Oberlin. He just kind of uh, drifted away. <laughs> I said we really miss him. He was a really nice kid. Don't know where he's gone. Uh, a woman afterwards came up to me, and this is at the big Marin uh, meeting, and she said, you know, you really shouldn't treat your students that way. <laughs> And I made some why. I thought she was joking for just a minute, and then I realized she was actually pretty serious. And I said, well, you know, they're, they, they're easy to come by. I mean, there are a lot of kids out there. So, so this is where we are. We're about, uh, as a sober crow would fly, we're about 83 miles from downtown Detroit. Toledo's to our uh, west, about an hour drive. Youngstown's about an hour and a half drive to the, uh, to the east. That's Rust Belt. This was the heart of the U.S. economy. This was the driver in the U.S. economy in uh, 19... 35 to 1965, give or take. This was the most prosperous part of the world. Youngstown, Ohio, in 1940, had the highest per capita income of any city in the United States. It is now derelict. The Youngstown, I remember as a kid growing up, uh, is gone. Uh, the downtown is completely uh, decimated. And all of you know about Detroit. And the question now is, what do we do with these cities? So anyway, Oberlin is... Um, uh, looks like this, very typical little Ohio downtown, quaint, cute, rustic. This is the Apollo Theater, it's right in the middle of the downtown. And this is important because off to the right of this is a block I'm going to describe in just a moment. It's the Green Arts District. Uh, this was a theater that uh, uh, opened in 1800. Uh, and it was when I got there, it was still showing first-run films. It was up to uh, Gone with the Wind. Hey, all that's just a joke, I'm sorry. but. <laughs> But I'll stop trying to be funny. Uh, this, the theater is uh, now the college cinematography program and runs first-run films and so forth. That was an anchor. Uh, you have a downtown without a theater. It was kind of a, a bad thing. This is the old school in town. It's been rehabbed as the Arts Center. Uh, this is the, uh, the Adam Joseph Lewis Center. And this was the start of what we're calling the Oberlin Project. This was uh, started in 1995. Uh, I came to Oberlin in 1990, and this was a building that we, uh, we did as part of the environmental studies program. 
and deal here was that uh, the college told me you can build a building, but uh, you can't go to any donor. You'll have to raise all the money yourself. You can't go to any donor uh, otherwise likely to give to the college. And so for years I went around and told people that that left me the Columbia Drug Cartel <laughs> as a funding source until somebody from Columbia told me, no, don't say that anymore. <laughs> so I stopped saying that. Uh, but the point, of the, the point of this was that we wanted to do a model of ecological design. Now, we're, I'm an educator, so we're visual creatures. 90% of our central apparatus is in our eyes, and so we, we believe what we can see. That, that's the most powerful thing for us. And most of us learn by seeing and doing and touching and so forth. So the goal here was to take a project uh, it resulted in a 14,200-square-foot building and make that an educational venture, do the best building we could possibly do. So we had 13 public design charrettes. We had 24 uh, folks who were from NASA to William McDonough and Amory Lovins and uh, Carol Franklin. We put together in the 1990s the A design team. And the point of all this was to start a dialogue about what kind of buildings we wanted to make. And so the students got together, and the first thing that in one of the charrettes, they said, well, we want a building that's solar powered. And my first response was, do you know where you are? This is Ohio. We get two sunny days a year. Uh, we get a lot of lake effect clouds. Uh, but to make the building powered by sunshine, that building last year generated 150% of its power needs. It does everything buildings do, air conditioning, heat, and so forth, but 150% generated by sunlight. Then they said, we want the building to uh, be a zero discharge building. And they thought they were kidding. And there are a lot of ways I've said that you can do zero discharge buildings. You can put the toilets in another building. Uh, you, can, you can do all kinds of things, but uh, we, we got a John Todd design living machine in the building, so you flush the toilet and go through the living machine, and, and more or less drinking water comes out the other side. So what we did here, for kids who are mostly seeing the world come undone, uh, they see a lot of violence. They see a lot of things happening. They, they follow those curves. They go up like this or down like that. And the question is, can we create models where they can bring the world back together again in some kind of harmony? So the most important thing about this building, it isn't the building. Buildings are just buildings. They will do damage and so forth. It's what they do to how we think. And that is the most important thing of this. And what we did here was to, uh, collectively was to put together a curriculum in applied hope. And so how do you get the world back together again? What's the built environment look like? What is this building's effect on, how does the building affect how we think and then what we can do? So that's the Adam Joseph Lewis Center. This is the back of the building. So the, the structure, it's about an acre and a quarter site. And what we wanted to do was to create a site that became a laboratory for young people. So the, uh, the building purifies its own wastewater, generates its own uh, energy. It grows a portion of the food that's uh, used in a dorm right beside it. So the idea is to make a working landscape and then also on the east side of the building is a little fingernail uh, size ecosystem that represents what had once been there and what may very well be there again at some future date. Uh, next slide. This is an auditorium, all the uh, materials in the building. This was designed back in the 19, or probably 1990s and so this was a platinum standard building before there was a USGBC rating system. This is the wastewater treatment system, a uh, living machine uh, designed by John Todd. So you flush the toilet, wastewater comes in, and the, uh, basically this is an indoor marsh. So it does the work of, uh, that marshes typically do, take out phosphorus and nitrogen and so forth. Next slide. This is a picture I took, and I waited until I got up to the, the sun got just to the right angle, and uh, this is a PV array, photovoltaic array on the roof of the building. Um, and I didn't realize how important this was until I saw this. In the next slide, I uh, gave a talk in England, and uh, I saw Rob Hopkins, who's the founder of the Transition Town Movement. Rob uh, used this slide, and he showed me this picture of uh, uh, Harvey's beer in England. And lo and behold, Harvey's beer had used my picture on their beer label. And uh, I didn't realize how important our building was until it shows up on, but my people are talking to their people. Uh, one of the items on the, the building was to make the building uh, transparent to data. So this was the start of a building that monitors its own energy use. This is, again, early part of the uh, uh, century. This is around 2001 or so. I worked with uh, NREL. Uh, and the group of scientists to put together a monitoring system for the building. So you get real-time feedback on energy you use and indoor air quality and lots of other things. Uh, this grew into a company uh, developed by a couple of Oakland students called Lucid Design. They're now all over, all over everything. Um, 
Now, let me just put these up in a, uh, all together. The, the Lewis Center grew into uh, what's called the Oberlin Project. And again, this is my response or our response to what do we do now? And so in this little uh, bench lab experiment or bench lab scale uh, urban experiment called Oberlin, what do we do that begins to change the world around us? So the Oberlin Project grew out of the, the Lewis Center. And we put together a partnership with the city and the college. And typically colleges look pretty much inward. We were saying, no, let's, let's join with the larger community. So if, in effect, you put a compass down in our town square, draw a circle with a, an eight-mile radius, that is the focal point for this. And the first goal was to rebuild the local economy. So uh, you'll see some slides in just a moment uh, showing the what's called the Green Arts uh, Project or Green Arts Neighborhood uh, that we are going to uh, use as the driver for the downtown economy. The second goal was to become carbon neutral. Uh, at the urban scale. And so we're one of three uh, uh, members of the Clinton Climate Initiative. Uh, we're one of four worldwide that have achieved participant status, which is a, a major accomplishment, and one of 18 worldwide that are part of the Clinton Climate Initiative. Um, we want to grow most of our food, and, and the reason for this is fairly obvious. With climate change, we're not going to import food from California at a volume we need, at a price we can afford, with climate change and higher energy costs and so forth. So we're going to have to reinvent agriculture locally uh, in Ohio. We used to be a state that had a quarter of a million or so farms. Now we're down to 65,000, most of which are in the corn soybean business. And then we want to do the Oberlin Project the way we did the Lewis Center and engage students with some of the most creative uh, designers and thinkers and doers and, and planners and so forth anywhere uh, in the world. So we've got the goal of a thousand students uh, being involved in this project over the next 10 years. Uh, we're up to already about 300. And then finally, and the last thing I'll do I'll, at the end of the talk, I'll describe a little bit of what we're doing to take this up to a, a much larger scale, both regional and, and uh, national. These are the four goals, and we tried to think about public policy. How do we organize as this kind of interloper organization a way to push economic development, change public policy, create new business opportunities, and change the food system? So we thought about these uh, uh, with a number of board meetings. We have a board that's made up of uh, 11 community members. Uh, how do we begin to rethink public policy in a way that drives things in a different direction? And we are a temporary kind of catalytic organization. Um, so we organized the community around seven working teams. Uh, Pat Doherty, a friend of mine at the New America Foundation, looked at all this and he said, well, that's full spectrum sustainability. And if you think about this, what we've done in this movement that we represent, we do renewable energy and then green building and then environmental education and sustainable ag. We do all these as if they're silos. And what we're trying to explore is how do we begin to pull these together in a way that every action in any one of those silos helps the others. And so full spectrum sustainability is just a very fancy way to say you're going to have lunch with lots of different kinds of people. You're going to have to learn languages that cross disparate boundaries. You're going to have to talk to people of different color, different backgrounds, different classes, and so forth. But you have to come together and begin to find the things that stitch a community together. So we've organized around agriculture, renewable energy, policy, and law, and so forth. And all of these are represented on the, the board. Uh, this is a slide from one of the most uh, brilliant thinkers in the Meadows, Danella Meadows. And Dana Meadows, uh, years ago, wrote, and you can Google her name and, and uh, put in leverage points. And what, uh, what she was asking here is, where do we intervene in complicated systems to cause what kind of change? And this isn't scriptural, you, and you can quarrel with this, but the point, the slide is organized here so that at the very top are the least effective things that we do. And most of what we do is that we argue about policy changes and taxes and so forth. And in her thinking, that, that is the least effective thing that we do. Then you get down to the bottom, and the change in worldviews and paradigms are the most effective things that we can do. Now, you can quarrel with this. You, know, you can say, well, the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, a legal thing up here at the top of this, changed paradigms and worldviews at the bottom. I mean, this is not scriptural. But the point of this for our community was to get people thinking. We gave out 300 copies of the article to get people thinking of how do we change systems and how do we begin to intervene to be effective. And there's a big difference between being right about things and being right and effective. It's real easy to be right or think you're right and to be totally ineffective. So where do you intervene? We want to uh, not impose ideas on people but begin to get people thinking about how this process actually works. Um, the first goal, let me just spend a little bit of time on this. This is the, uh, the Green Arts District. 
Uh, it's a 13-acre block. Uh, if you know anything about Oberlin, it, there's a town square that's 13 acres, Tappan Square, named for the Tappan brothers who were abolitionists and New York businessmen. And then to the east of that is another 13-acre block. We label this the Green Arts District. And this is what it looks like. At the very top is one of the famous art museums in American higher education, ranked behind those only at Harvard and Yale. Uh, that has been already redone at the league gold level for the cost of about $11 million. The savings are incredible. And this is a tough building to do. It's a, it's a museum. In the middle here, uh, on the west face of the block, which is to your right, uh, Hall Auditorium and Performing Arts Center and Performing Arts at Oberlin are, are terrific. It is one of the major things that the college does. And then down at the bottom is the Oberlin College Inn. Uh, that's that kind of black uh, roof building. I used to say that that was a plausible excuse for limited nuclear war. Uh, my boss, uh, Marvin Krizloff, who I work for, uh, told me don't ever, he's president of the college, he said don't ever say that again, so I don't. Um, but this was built to the uh, very exacting comfort and aesthetic standards of uh, interstate motels in 1955. Incredible building. Uh, we want to take it out. So th this is the uh, Allen Art Museum. That's Performing Arts Center. Uh, this is the, uh, well, probably this is the Jazz Building, which is the only lead-rated jazz building, I think, in the world. Maybe the only jazz building in the world. All right, I'm not. <laughs> Boy, this is this. Uh, my granddaughter, who's age uh, 10 and has the personality of Queen Elizabeth uh, on steroids, Queen Elizabeth I on steroids. Uh, she said after one of my talks, said, Granddad, I really like your talk, but it was boring. <laughs> yeah, thought about that a little bit. And when we get into sustainability and climate change and all these issues that we find that animate our lives, oftentimes we hit one side of the brain. It's parts per million. It's parts per billion. It's architecture. It's, it's all this wonky stuff. Now, Len mentioned the idea of uh, having a party. Why don't we think about this conversation about sustainability in a larger context? And for us at Oberlin, we have, I think, a very unique opportunity. We have great art. We have a great conservatory of music. We have a great performing arts program. And oh, by the way, a new hotel, which I'll show you in just a minute, that'll be solar powered, entirely solar powered, uh, and featuring a four-star restaurant that has local foods and the energy is generated locally and so forth. And so create this sense of sustainability as a much larger thing. So we're hitting the arts part of your brain and the creative part of your brain, and the humorous part of the brain, the fun part, the celebratory part, and also the science and analytical part. So we, we need to have a big conversation here. This cannot be just about environment and economics and all this finger-wagging stuff that I, you know, I'm good at doing that. I've got preacher blood, as you know. So uh, we've we got to have a party here. So the idea here is to begin to combine our assets and make this something a lot more of a party. This is the Oberlin end that's going to go. This is the schematic for this, and the lower left-hand corner, as you look at this, um, or lower right-hand corner, as you look at it, will be the new inn. Uh, Solomon Cordwell Buns from Chicago here, the design Crate and Barrel, among other things, here on Michigan Avenue, is the architect on this. These are the components of this. A hotel, restaurant, performing arts, music, housing, business, advanced technology. So we want to do this in a way that uh, drives the local economy and comes in at the uh, highest lead rating possible. Now I want to issue a caveat. All this again is just hardware. It's just stuff. The real change is how we think. And so the point here is to create a means to an end. This is not the end. This is a way to get the facilities together where we can begin to demonstrate things and stretch the people's ecological imagination, a sense of what is possible to do in the world and get those large conversations. This is what it'll look like. So looking diagonally across the main street, the conference center part is on the, the left side of the screen. Uh, the hotel commercial space on the right-hand side, this will also have a jazz club. This is the conference center component. Uh, these are, by the way, are not uh, architectural renderings. These are simply the uh, schematic drawings. This is what the interior could look like, uh, one of the entryways. And then we're looking hard at energy savings. And one of the things we've done on this is try to figure out how to fund this. This is a $32 million project. We're still hustling for the last roughly one million. Uh, but we're trying to understand how you fund these. So we've got one California donor or some note who said, I'll put a million dollars into the project, but I want to be paid back out of savings. And so the deal that we've worked out is 
that the difference between this building done at the silver level and the building as, as built at the platinum level, which we think is roughly 100000 to 150000 per year, that's what he'll be paid out of. And so we're trying to understand finance here in every way that we can. So how do we get creative about the way money works? And can we take the, the idea of a sustainable society and figure out how to discount the savings and some of those avoided black swan events and some of the costs that go with the development as we conceive this? Back and discount that back to net present value. We've got to get very clever about how we use money in this world. We aren't nearly as rich as we thought we were. Um, these are integration of technical systems and some of the uh, service systems. I want to get into that. This is a building done immediately across the street by three former Oakland students who, in the, the uh, lingo of higher education, failed to launch. So they graduated, and they didn't go anywhere. They stayed in town. They formed a development company, and they've done an incredible thing. This is a $17 million lead gold project, uh, mixed housing, 33 condominiums in the top, commercial space in the bottom, and a third building behind this, which is a housing development, or probably an office building. Um, this is the back of uh, one of the buildings. This became important to us for a couple of reasons. One is it anchored the south side of the Green Arts District. Uh, it was, for me, more importantly, it was an example of what kids in their early 20s could do. We, we tend to think that success in this world and, and our salvation lies somehow with people in their 50s and 60s and so forth, old folks, my age and so forth. But what they showed was it's possible for people to come out of college, roll up their sleeves, and get to work right away. Uh, and it's possible to do that younger. We need all hands on deck at this point in human history. So the, these, these guys showed up uh, very well. This is Sherrod Brown, in the U.S. Senate. That's 100 kW Ray at the uh, uh, Lewis Center. This is a three uh, megawatt output uh, solar system that went alive about a year ago. And so uh, we're aiming to get to carbon neutrality. Our electric system in the town will be about 90% carbon free this year. Uh, and th this is part of it. Our base load is around, uh, hey, thank you for that. Y you all can applaud if you want to. <laughs> Uh, now, we want to grow uh, 70, the, the goal is to grow 70% of our food within an 8 to 10 mile radius. So this is the first farm that we created. We're now working to uh, develop a food hub. This is kind of a summary. Um, everything in black we've done, everything in red is yet to be done. Uh, the focal point for us is going to be at the south end of this, at the bottom of the slide on the screen. That's where most of the poverty in our town is concentrated. So the Oberlin Project is directing most of our time and effort to creating jobs and business and improving housing and so forth in the, the poorest part of the city. Uh, we also are going to do the, at the top on the right-hand side a public school at 30 to 35 million, which will be done like we did the Lewis Center. So entirely solar power, zero discharge. Th this is what we've done. We've so far spent about $60 million with another roughly 32 or 33 in play. Uh, one more there. Most of this is private investment. And so we can take a, uh, a dollar of philanthropy and convert that into five or five and a half dollars of uh, investment. So we're trying to understand the finance. How do you actually pay for sustainability? After all the fancy words are spoken and all the, the glorified, glorified visions are uh, out there, how do we actually do this financially? Uh, next slide. Uh, we're part of the Clinton Climate Initiative, which I mentioned. Go on, next slide. Uh, so what, what is this? Well, it depends on your uh, vantage point. If uh, you take a beam of light and run it through a crystal, it refracts at a variety of bandwidth. So for an Oakland student coming into town, it's, it's kind of a cool 24-7 downtown. For college faculty and, and so forth, it's better facilities in the uh, Green Arts District. Uh, for local business, it's more business. For Sherrod Brown in the U.S. Senate, it's a model of economic renewal in the heart of the Rust Belt. Uh, for Bill Clinton, it's climate action, uh, and President Clinton and I, when he was governor of Arkansas, sponsored 25 years ago the first conference for bankers and climate scientists in 1988. Uh, he pointed that out at a speech the other day, and I, I've kind of forgotten about that, but that was 25 years ago. It was just 25 years before its time. And now we have to go back and understand how the economics of all this work relative to climate change, and time again is not our friend. As an educator, uh, this is a terrific educational laboratory. It gets kids out of the classroom, puts them in Main Street, where they have to go back to the classroom to get specific ideas and theories and knowledge to come back out to Main Street to be effective. And so th this is a way to combine talk, walk, and so forth in an actual place where uh, Oberlin students will uh, reshape the city. For the design team, it's the first model of integrated full-spectrum design. 
We're saying you can't just design a building. You have to design transportation and food systems and energy and justice issues and education. You've got to do this as a full-spectrum project. And I think it's probably the first or one of the very few uh, in the world that uh, works this way. And then it's, of course, national security issues because national security starts at the bottom and works up. It does, doesn't just start the shores and borders and work out. So it's, it's how we organize food and energy and banking and all these other things. Next slide. Uh, this will all be a failure unless we do a number of things, the most important of which is to take this up to the regional and national and eventually the global scale. So this is a challenge for us. We're a, we're a neighborhood compared to anything here in Chicago. We're a small neighborhood. And so what we see this as is a bench lab scale experiment. Can people come together and reorganize the way governments work and the way institutions work and the way we build and the way we think? Can we collectively come together? Uh, we keep hearing that Washington is broken. Uh, it is certainly inactive on these issues or uh, antagonistic. So what can we do at the grassroots? So we're seeing this as uh, what the Irish would call a fierce commotion. But it, it's going to fail if this little bubble called Oberlin is all that ever happens. And a little bubble may be called Chicago, a much bigger bubble called Chicago. This has to go viral. It has to change the way we think about the world. And again, time's not our friend. So we've been working with a number of folks across the country to develop, take this idea of full-spectrum sustainability to the regional scale. And uh, for us, this means what's called the Lake Erie Crescent Project. So starting at Flint, Michigan, where the mayor faces an income that drops 20% per year, tax revenues 20% per year. That's a city in free fall. And you know all about Detroit and the efforts in Detroit, uh, positive and then the, the scale, the magnitude of the, the, the challenges. And then Toledo, Oberlin, Cleveland, Youngstown. So we've taken some of the worst cities, but in the heart of that, that uh, U.S. economy uh, in the 1940s to 1965 or so, uh, and said, so can we come together? And we're, we're premises on two things. One is uh, Ben Franklin's old thing, hang together, hang separately. So can we solve Detroit problems at a regional scale when you can't solve them necessarily within Detroit? And then from Jane Jacobs, the great urban theorist, who said, buy local. She called it import substitution. So can we begin to think about what Cleveland can sell to Detroit and vice versa? And it could be electronic equipment, it could be solar collectors, it could be food, it could be a million different kind of products. But can we begin to come together as a regional scale? So we're in conversations with uh, folks around uh, the Lake Erie Crescent, including Michigan State, Case Western, uh, three big foundations, the mayors and presidents of a number of uh, uh, cities and institutions around the, the region to come together. Can we begin to come together in a collective way to solve regional scale problems? Uh, the same thing is happening in California. Uh, three different clusters are forming in California. The front range of the Rocky Mountains around Denver, the southeast around Atlanta, the northeast I'm, where I'm headed uh, tonight, uh, and the mid-Atlantic states. So can we begin to do regionally what we cannot do nationally and we can't do separately as uh, cities? Next slide. Um, now, I want to close with a couple of thoughts. It is so easy to look at all these numbers as binaries and just say, man, this is too big. You can't get there. But we live in a different era. That's the hard truth we have to face. That's the voltage. That's part of the voltage in the line. The other part of the voltage in the line is that there's still a world worth fighting for here. This was my version of it. I mean, the world, the greenhouse world, is still going to be lots to fight for. This is a world where we can have local farms and food and powered by sunshine and more baseball leagues and bike trails and more time spent with kids and less time spent with shopping. Imagine that. Front porches, community work. The word neighbor becomes a verb, not a noun. Fewer shopping malls, less traffic, no oil wars. That's almost un-American, but you I mean imagine that world. No oil saturated politics and so forth. You can down this list, you can make a much longer list. That's a world worth fighting for. But that's not the world, that's not where we're headed. We're headed in the direction of a black swan world. You know all the, the kind of numbers that we're, we're talking about. Next slide. Now, I want to end with this. Uh, this is one of the great uh, speeches of, in American history, maybe all time. <coughs> this is Martin Luther King. And this is the, the fierce urgency of now speech. He gave it a year before he, um, he was killed. He said, there's such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of man does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. 
Now, <clears throat> what Bind Ears is about, what your work is about, what mine's about, and, and uh, literally thousands of us around this city and this region, and millions of us around the world, are struggling against us so that we are not too late. We've got to face the reality. The big numbers are running against us. Uh, but there is hope, and I think we're going to win this. But it means that we get together and we move as rapidly as we can in every way that we can, wherever you are, your neighborhoods, your houses, your churches, your organizations, your corporations, your schools, your universities. And we come together as we've never come together before so that nobody can ever say that we were too late. We acted in time. Thank you very much and thank you for all that you do. <laughs> have eight minutes for uh, questions. Any, any thoughts and comments? Yes, right here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, say as gardeners, uh, we like to say instead of going viral, our ideas go fungal. Fungal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a all right, I got it. Um, Good point. I wanted to just thank you, Dr. Orr. Uh, at, we uh, started a, uh, we built a passive solar home about 30 years ago with a permaculture landscape. And um, as uh, Aldo Leopold wrote, uh, when you uh, have a certain kind of knowledge that no one else is aware of, uh, it can be very painful and isolating. And so over the years, as we have read your books, you have been a great comfort to us, as you are today, uh, giving us this uh, knowledge that I'm sure uh, is um, going to be, uh, again, very isolating to us who live well, thank, in the Thank summer. you very much for that. And uh, so thank you for the great work you're doing. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I totally um, understand and appreciate what you're saying in terms of time to organize, organize mm -hmm. at any level, organize with your friends, start small, grow big. Are you also developing toolkits to help um, neighbors organize and get involved and get engaged and reclaim the civic world? We are working through schools to do that through churches in, in, their, in Oberlin. There are about 24 churches in the, in a city of around 10,000. So the churches are a big player in all this. So civic organizations, churches, schools, the college, uh, the public schools, the joint vocational school, but the short answer is yes. We're trying to, we're trying to organize so that th this becomes, I think it's got to be more like a network and, and it's got to go fungal uh, at, at that level. Uh, but, Yeah, go to the website. There'll be more of that come out in the next uh, 24 months. But go, go to the uh, Open Project website and you'll see some of what's coming out, though. But th thanks for that. Had a question uh, up here. We'll, we'll go ahead. And take... uh, you mentioned your students coming back, or in some cases not even leaving Oberlin and, and being useful citizens. Uh -huh. Have you attempted systematically to do longitudinal studies to see what impact, obviously, you and the remarkable curriculum that your college has, what impact does it have in the life choices of your graduates to make the case that the paradigm shift that you say is so important right. is catching on and that these kids aren't just going to Wall Street after having a fun time in Oberlin? You know, that's a really good question. First of all, I don't think they describe, Peter can correct me on this, but I don't think kids describe the four years at Oberlin as a fun time. <laughs> I think that they, they, they describe it more as, a, oh, God, well, that's over. But, I mean, it's a, it's a rigorous kind of place. And these are academically serious kids. Your question is a good, good question. I haven't done that personally. The college departments do. But I will say, as a footnote to the question, I think higher education still graduates an awful lot of kids who don't have a clue about how the world works as a physical system, why that's important to them. And I'd be willing to wager that we're better than some, but we're still not as good, nearly as good as we need to be. Uh, I've got to give a talk to the whole campus community on Friday next week, and this will be one of the themes of it. But your, your question strikes uh, a really important point. I don't think we do. I don't think we track it enough, and I don't think if we did track it, we would find that we've had nearly enough impact. Some students, yes. But it's all the way through the curriculum. I think we graduate an awful lot of kids who don't have a clue how to connect different departments and disciplines and why that's important to their careers. But th thanks for that, that point. Um, yes, thank you. The, um, 
One comment and then a question. I'm, I'm really glad that you, you specified that everybody get involved because we're still facing today, especially the way cities uh, select contractors mm -hmm. and so forth, the professional um, crowd, which has definitely uh, done such a bad job in the past that we all have to get involved and, and everybody must be at the table. My question is, you've done a lot of work here uh, with new buildings. Uh, are you doing anything with the older oh, buildings and there retrofitting? Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the point here is a good point because uh, the idea that we build new and it's shiny and it's new and so forth, but the old issue of it is all architects know, the embodied energy in the existing infrastructure is awfully important. You can't just tear stuff down unless there's a good reason for it. Unless you have something like the Oberlin Inn, which is a plausible... <laughs> needs to go. But we, we did look at the Oberlin Inn, and we, we spent a quarter million dollars in one year looking to see if you could rehab it. Uh, and the, the walls of the Oberlin Inn are literally R4.2. Well, our phone book in Oberlin is 4.2. Can't rehab it. Got to go. Uh, there was no way to, to do that in any way that's cost effective. But th thanks for the question, and the answer is, is yes. Hi, uh, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, originally, and, um, I and where, just... Where are you? I'm right here. Oh, right there, okay. Thank you. Hi. And I just wanted to say that they're, because of the university, they are an improving city, and mm -hmm. uh, the model that Oberlin has used, I would hope that there's uh, a few uh, um, uh, people coming from Oberlin into the university system in Youngstown, because I know that they're redeveloping the downtown. My father was actually a part of putting money into that system to help it work. That's great. So... That's great. Um, um, it's not all bad there. It's definitely improving. You know, the, you're right, and it wasn't all great way back when. Uh, Tim Ryan, a congressman from Youngstown, uh, and I were on a long conference call about the Oberlin Project and so forth. He was excited about doing it. Let me, let me say one comment, actually two comments. One is that the Youngstown I remember as a kid, I grew up in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, 17 miles east. <laughs> The Youngstown, I remember uh, as a kid, was crime-ridden, brawling, prosperous. It was an urban city but it had a lot of problems. And that was an industrial economy that was going to the edge of the cliff. That was the, the, the precursor to this black swan world of Nicholas Taleb. Uh, that was not sustainable. And the question is now for all of us, what does a sustainable economy look like? What, what do we do? What do we sell each other? And so forth. And this is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff, you know, the windmills and the solar collectors and green design, all that does is buy us time. And then the question for us is time for what? what, what what's a species that, that calls itself Homo sapiens? What do we do? And how do we make a life and our livelihood in a way that uh, can be beautiful, fair, decent, green, and sustainable over long periods of time? I don't like the word sustainable, by the way. I mean, it, it's boring. Uh, my granddaughter found it. But, but how do we, it, it's overused. Bill McDonough's old comment about if you describe the relationship with uh, you and your spouse or whatever, and say, well, it's sustainable. You know, that's exciting, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> So anyway, we've got to rethink what an economy is like. I and mean, a, uh, a good bit of what I'm now aiming to do over the next couple of years is to rethink uh, economics uh, as if this small planet really mattered. Do we have time for one more question? How about if we replace the word sustainability with vitally alive? Well, I like that. The, the uh, uh, suggestion is make sustainable and vitally alive. And, you know, words matter here. That, that was a really good, good point. Uh, Somebody said at a meeting a couple of days ago that the, the point of all this stuff isn't health. Health is a means to feeling alive. And it's that sense of aliveness that needs to be uh, our long-term goal. Health is just a means to get there. Uh, so words, words matter. Is it time for one more reason? Yeah. Uh, the labor movement played an important role in the former prosperity of the Rust Belt region. Mm -hmm. What role do you see the labor movement playing in the uh, kind of sustainability vision that you have today? And we have another hour, uh, right? <laughs> Boy, uh, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, you know, the short answer is I really don't know, but it's a great question. And if I say, what does this economy that, that can be sustained and enlivening look like? I'll tell you what it won't look like. It won't look like where 400 people, you could easily fit them into space, have more net wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans. Can't get there from here. If inequity and, and we got the middle class going south, the bottom class going further south, we got a problem. And this, this is now global. There's another issue. At a meeting at MIT uh, in December, 
two presentations were back to back. The first was by a, a great teacher from California who was teaching his kid to have robots. His kids were designing, these are high school kids, designing these little machines to go around and they would scoop up basketballs and they'd shoot at a goal and uh, then they'd go shoot, snarf up other basketballs and shoot them at a goal. So the winning team's robot had scored more points than the other teams. You got what I'm saying? The very next presentation was from a labor uh, guy, two labor uh, uh, experts at MIT, just written a book on robotics, automation, and the labor economy. We're designing a world where we don't fit. We're going to work for people. And with uh, uh, various kind of things like uh, nanotechnologies and so forth, we're designing a world where Homo Faber disappears, the maker, in place of uh, 3D printers. And uh, robots will make, well, who is there to buy all this stuff? And so the old problem that Henry Ford had to address about how, how to people how to create a, a living wage at five dollar wage where people can actually afford to buy a Model T. You follow what I'm saying? We've got some big thinking to do. And I, I would end this by saying this: I don't know what the future of labor unions is or the future of labor in this world, but I know that we have to rethink what it is that we buy and sell from each other. Instead of efficiency, we need to get as Wolfgang Sox said years ago: sufficiency. What do we really need? We need a sense of fairness, and that needs to be written through all of this. And then the final thing I'd say, we aren't going to get there unless we rethink our politics. We do not have a political system now in which it's not democratic. Whatever else you call it, it is not a democracy. This is a manipulated society. I'm not saying anything anybody here doesn't know already. So we have to rethink the way we conduct the public business, and that's political. And so I don't see any way to get there to even deal with questions like that unless we become citizens again. And let me leave one historical analogy in your, in your mind. Abraham Lincoln here in, in Illinois. Uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, there were seven of them. And you think of what, what went on in those Lincoln-Douglas debates. Lincoln and Douglas go around in, in various kind of places, and they would talk for an hour, and then the rebuttal comes, and they, can, and they give the rebuttal to the rebuttal. And here, there's no sound system. And you have these uh, uneducated country bumpkins, and there were no soft chairs and so forth, probably standing and listening hour after hour to these two people. There were no sound bites there. Talk about the big issues of the day, slavery, sexualism, tariffs, and so forth. And they listened. And you could tell they listened because if you read the whole transcript, they jeered, they laughed, they applauded. They were listening. Those were citizens. And some of them went and fought and died for the ideas that they believed in and heard. And that was citizenry. And we have to recover that sense of citizenry now in electronic era. And we are so distracted with you know, Facebook and celebrity TV and football and so forth. Now we have to re-engage. And you think of those people, as much as was at stake in the Civil War, there was a lot at stake. But it pales to infinity compared to what's at stake now. We're talking about the survival of the whole human enterprise, enterprise and the terms on which that survival is played out. That's what we're talking about. Um, and time, in this case, is not our friend. We've got to recover a sense of citizenship. And I don't know what that's going to be, but until we get to questions of labor and growth and fairness and distribution, what do we want to be as a species as we grow up? So all this stuff about sustainability and, and ecological design, I'm all for it. I mean, I'm part of that in anywhere I can be. But all that's a means to this end. And there needs to be a large conversation. This is a big conversation. Thank you very much for that.